our professor dr durga nai okay what about abdominal distension sir there was no history of abdominal distension we did not complain of any abdominal distension sir dr rajshekar any other questions you wanted to ask sir no sir okay i think uh, your uh, your good name is ashwin 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 i think the history has been taken well it is complete there is no major lacuna in the history so you have summarized it well so now go to the clinical is dr mohan uh, on the board now harish is dr mohan there hello ha ah. hello is dr mohan there ha ah, good evening dr mohan hello good evening dr mohan ha uh, i think uh, he is still probably there is some audio issues with him hello hello no uh the, you go on with the presentation now the clinical examination findings good evening everyone i'm dr manish i'll be presenting the examination part no sir old patient moderately built and well oriented to oriented to time place and person was examined in a well lit room with adequate exposure from nipple to mid thigh in supine position his weight was about 80 kg height 106 cm and body mass index of 25.8 vitals bp 120 70 mm of mercury measured in right arm in supine position pulse rate 80 beats per minute in right radial artery respiratory rate of 16 cycles per minute there was no pallor ictus clubbing cyanosis generalized lymphadenopathy or pedal edema on abdominal examination infection fullness was noted yeah. fullness was noted in the epigastric region and rest of the abdomen appears normal umbilicus is pushed downwards and inverted quadrants move equally with respiration there was no visible peristalsis pulsations scars or dilated veins arneal orifices appear normal external genitalia appears normal on palpation abdomen is soft and non tender a solitary mass of size 8 to 7 cm is felt in the epigastrium extending in right hypochondrium upper border is not made out not able to insinuate fingers between the mass and the coastal margin right lateral border is about 6 cm right of the midline left lateral border is 2 cm to left of the midline lower border is 7 cm from the zygoid process and rounded borders smooth surface form in consistency it moves with respiration there was no solid organ organomegaly or no other mass palpable on percussion abdomen is resonant dullness noted over the mass which was continuous with liver dullness liver dullness starts at the fourth intercostal space in the mid clavicular line no evidence of free fluid in the abdomen on auscultation bowel sounds were heard no bruvi was heard left supraclavicular fossa appears normal external genitalia was normal digital rectal, rectal examination was normal and spine was normal okay summarize your uh, clinical findings uh, so 55 year old male patient sir who came with uh, complaints of uh, pain abdomen since one year and fever since six months on examination there was solitary mass of 8 cross 7 cm mainly in the epigastrium extending to the right hypochondrium upper border was not clearly made out and uh, we were not able to insinuate fingers between the mass and the coastal margin the left lateral border was 5 cm to the midline the right lateral border was 3 cm to the midline lower border was about 7 cm from the zygoid process it was it has a smooth surface it's firm in consistency and it moves with respiration okay um Mo uh, professor mohan are you there now sir is still traveling i think ah. you need to see okay think, okay uh, dr durgana sir can also join for the discussion yeah so, but uh, i think dr mohan makes a point that it is not correct to say there is no organomegaly uh, i think uh, it, uh, it is a contentious thing but what you should say is you cannot palpate spleen or any other you know no organ is clinically palpable maybe that is a, probably a better terminology to use because even if the organ is increased in size till it becomes palpable it may not be you know if it doesn't become palpable there is still organomegaly but it is not palpable okay. so for that reason i think students should say spleen is not clinically palpable or kidneys are not clinically palpable um, that is probably a you know, safer terminology to use dr rajshekar any questions sir for so far uh no abdominal examination is complete without uh, rectal examination he has mentioned that rectal examination is normal okay okay so i must have missed 
Yeah. No findings in that. No, no findings. He, he said the rectal examination is normal. Okay. Okay. Um, and he has mentioned gen no generalized lymphadenopathy, no ed edema and anything. So, and there is no ascites. So, with this finding, uh, what, what do you think is the possible diagnosis? Or would you like to offer differential diagnosis? Uh, sir, my provisional diagnosis, sir, anatomical, I would like to give a localized liver mass as my first, uh, from, uh, as my anatomical diagnosis, sir. For oh. pathological, hydratid cyst would be my first differential, hepatoma second, and chronic liver abscess my third differential. Um, chronic liver abscess, what conditions would you get chronic liver abscess? Have you seen a liver abscess persisting for one year? Sir, certain times amoebic uh, hepatic abscess, may it may remain dormant for a longer period of time, sir. So you meant uh, not, not a pyogenic abscess, but an amoebic liver abscess. Amoebic hepatic abscess. Gen I think, uh, you know, I have not seen an amoebic abscess which is lasted for a year without, uh, you know, though it has caused symptoms, without actually causing complications. You know, I think it may be dormant for a month or two at th or three at the most, but then it will, you know, cause a lot of problems and symptoms. Doctor, if Dr. Durgana is there, um, who, uh, what is his view on that, sir? Dr. Durgana? Keeping as a last resort. Huh. But, uh, no, but uh, clinical findings and uh, history, there is no suggestion of any amoebic liver abscess. Correct. Because you, um, if you mentioned, if I remember your uh, clinical examination, it is non-tender, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Non -tender. The mass is not tender. Yes. So, you will not get a non-tender mass in with amoebic liver abscess. So, so, that is why it may be non-plausible. And um, what about the surface? You said the surface is smooth. Smooth yes, surface. Sir. Would you get smooth surface with the hydratid cyst? Yes, sir. yes, sir. So, the, there will not be any you know, mild you know, indentations, bosselations, nothing. It will be a very smooth surface. Most of the time, it's always uh, you know, sir, the side, sir, and then it's always uh, unilocular, unilocular, sir, in liver. So, always it will be a smooth surface, single solitary swelling. It is always unilocular? Not necessarily, sir. Um, you said it will it always be unilocular. It can be multilocular also because there is a, uh, you know, the echinococcus multilocularis. So, that is uh, where you get multiple hydratid cysts. So, you, you can't say just because of that, that it is a hydratid cyst. Why can't it be, he is a 55-year-old male, right? Yes, sir. Why, why can't it be hepatocellular carcinoma? I don't think you should use the word hepatoma because hepatoma is not used anymore. So, hepatocellular carcinoma, why, why can't it be that? Sir, what okay. are the points against it? Sir, on, on palpation, sir. Uh, hepatocellular... No, no, don't go for palpation. Yes, you know, go Basically, for... There are no constitutional symptoms as such, sir. Okay. So, hepatocellular carcinoma patient would have given history of loss of weight uh, or loss of appetite and then there might be all, also be history of uh, jaundice and also other symptoms, sir. But there was no such symptom. It was just a, a pain. Abdomen was the only complaint and fever on and off. Uh, see, so, that might have just not see, actually point to a separate correct. carcinoma. Correct. See, the thing is there are no other symptoms like pre previous history of, uh, you know, the viral hepatitis or alcoholic liver disease. Because, you know, the, the, you know, no doubt a hepatocellular carcinoma can arise de novo, but they sh usually there are, you know, sort of predisposing factors like, um, you know, a, a viral hep long-standing viral hepatitis or alcoholic liver Hello. disease. Huh. Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, Mohan. sir. Audible, sir. Mohan, sir. Go ahead, Mohan. Good evening, Dr. Mohan. Professor Mohan, are you there? I think he's still having problems with his audio. Okay, so the, you, you know, first history in the history, as you said, there are no constitutional symptoms, no history of loss of appetite or weight loss. Those symptoms may or may not be there, but generally if they are there, it may go in favor of that. And especially loss of weight and no, you know, symptoms suggestive of hepatitis or alcohol consumption or working in, you know, uh, dye industry and things like that. So basically, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, these are symptoms. And then on clinical examination, it is a firm mass. You said it is not, you know, firm to hard. You will have a 
and it will also be the, the irregular the surface will be irregular and edges also will be irregular so you know all these features you know you have to come out you whenever you say something we are not questioning the, you know the the fact that you have stated it but you should be able to justify why you made the diagnosis of hydatidosis first and the hepatocellular carcinoma second and uh, as you said you know chronic liver abscess because in medicine nothing is 100% we can consider that as one of the differential diagnosis but uh, there are a lot of points against it obviously okay um, mohan are you there now okay um, in addition to the issue what i suggest actually yeah the uh, predisposing factors no? yeah what you told all the uh, blood transfusion or history of hepatitis correct or alcoholic and yeah is there any uh, drug abuse correct testing favor for the uh, hepatoma other find is clinical finding as you said there is a usually chance of cystic degeneration will be there in the hepatocellular carcinoma carcinoma so that will be usually gives a, a slight tenderness and palpation correct hmm. that will also not there correct it will unlikely be autistic and general condition of the patient is well maintained well maintained Aspect. yeah that is again another and another thing is uh, you mentioned jaundice jaundice is not always an essential feature not, of hepatocellular carcinoma it can happen but it will be fairly late in the uh, course of the illness okay okay so and now i think i how, have asked actually suppose the cirrhotic liver yeah if you suspect it has gone for the malignancy malignancy yeah in those patients they may have jaundice because of the cirrhosis so that is why i mentioned that all these you know the predisposing factors you know play a very important role in uh, you know in you know deciphering what is your first you know differential diagnosis and second but i think uh, these are the points that we can accept ex uh, and uh, would you not consider a, a you know focal nodular hyperplasia of the liver as one of the differential diagnosis sir that's that's all because radiological diagnosis pathological okay. and radiological correct correct but it can be one of the yes sir it ca it can't be completely ruled out sir it can't be ruled out it can't what be about what about hemangioma the hemangioma usually but the same sir hemangioma such large hemangiomas uh, presenting in the liver is usually is there sir but then the consistency it's form usually hemangiomas may not be that form and also most of it was always diagnosed incidentally on radiological examinations sir. so correct usually so you, you you can consider them as differential diagnosis but most of the time there are no specific features uh, which could um, which you know which which would you know point towards either if the patient has symptoms suggestive of consumption coagulopathy maybe then you can consider hemangioma otherwise it is yes, difficult yes. to make a pre operative clinical diagnosis yes. and i think dr mohan also suggests that um, you know benign considering benign diseases of the liver would be more far more probable in this in this particular you know symptomatology compared to a malignancy because there are no features as you said suggestive of the disease being malignant and intercostal tenderness again is a very important uh, finding sign of uh, liver abscess sir if it is there then it may suggest that it is liver abscess okay so now uh, how would sir. you investigate this patient uh, dr rajshekar sir uh, what about uh, tumors arising from gall bladder sir okay. also clinically what to Sir, sir, tumor arising from the gall bladder, sir. We would have made out the uh, uh, liver surface. It will be we would have found out, sir. And also, it will be in the midclavicular line and rounded margin, sir. And the uh, there is in this case there is we can't insinuate the fingers between the liver and the coastal margins. That yeah. Also, mobility, that, sir. Mobility also will be there, sir. These all these points, but also you have to remember if somebody has been going on for a year. with the gallbladder cancer he would be dead by now because most gallbladder cancers you know the uh, from the time of diagnosis to death is about 4 to 6 months it is the third most rapidly you know fatal you know disease after glioblastoma multiforme and you know and uh, uh, carcinoma of the head of the pancreas and uh, gallbladder cancer is third so it is a very you know deadly cancer so you know i i think you know dr rajshekar's point is very well taken because of the anatomic location of the of the mass 
you have to consider but the points that you have made are are right you know in the sense these are the points against it for it being a gallbladder mass okay um so i think if there are no other questions we shall move on and uh, uh, please uh, you know enumerate how would you investigate this patient Sir, either of you either of you so we'd like to get a complete blood count and liver function tested correct uh, after that we what like do you expect in the all these things sir in complete blood count if there is an acute liver abscess there might be uh, elevated leukocytes sir would you expect this to be an acute liver abscess no sir it can't be okay. it can't be okay at at worst it may at best it is a chronic you know separative condition so you wouldn't expect the white cell count to be raised anyway but we do need to get the complete blood count right and what else in case of an hydatidosis there might be elevated uh, eosinophilia sir so that that might be suggestive of uh, okay hydatidosis sir then hmm. moving ahead we'd like to get an ultrasonogram sir about s1 you don't want to get an alpha fetoprotein and all that or first, you wait you would wait for the ultrasound to then yes, make a first get an ultrasound done sir uh, based on if it's a cystic or a solid lesion then i move ahead with my other investigation sir okay right fine Uh, what what are the things you would look for in an ultrasound scan? Sir, what what sir, will an ultrasound scan tell you? Sir, it will tell us about the organ involvement, sir. About the uh, swelling. Origin is, origin of the mass. Origin of okay. the mass, sir. If the swelling is cystic or uh, solid, sir. Yeah, or or mixed, sir. It or, could be a mixed mixed tumor. You know, mixed consists as Doctor Durgana was saying. If there is cystic degeneration. you may have a solid uh, component and a, a you know a cystic component as well okay then what else it will tell us about the lymph node status sir it yeah vascularity sir vascularity also sir if it's vascular so what will tell you the vascularity why waste all the time in doing ultrasound one or two days why not do a ct scan directly anyway you will again come back to ct scan after all this Right. Yeah, I think I Venkat, your point is well taken. But generally, the students are expected to go from the uh, you know, small, lesser investigation to the higher investigation so because the ultrasound it is okay during my exam. Today yeah. because it is can I think. Actually, I, I I agree, but still I think. I'll no, see students, you after month. Some examiners will ask, "Oh, you want to do a CCT CC, CCT before doing a ultrasound?" So, no, but ultrasound actually, I think I beg to differ with you, Venkat. There are. lot of you know points that you can actually make and nowadays ultrasound is very good because you have a 3d ultrasound you have contrast in an ultrasound so don't uh, neglect ultrasound to certain done ravi you will again come back to ct scan that is why yeah yeah, yeah. no but for example venkat uh, ravi shankar i differ with uh, venkat yeah. usually if there is a cyst in a cyst definitely the diagnostic of hydra disease if yeah. that is there there is no ct scan is required unless the situation of the Hydatid cyst is warrant CT. No, so where you are to go? Just the ultrasound. If it is a peripheral situated, there is no need of going for a CT. No, unless you are charging the patient. So time and again, we are ending up with problems by doing only an ultrasound. We see that routinely every day. So we, it is nothing wrong in doing a CT scan in an institution. Let's not bring economics into discussion. Let's no, no, I, I didn't mention economics at all. No, ultrasound actually these days is exceptionally good. it can give you a lot of information it will give it will have doppler it will give you the vascularity of the mass it will give you the extent yeah, the See, only thing what i am trying to tell you is when will we go out of this ultrasound as an examination question knowingly that we will still do the ct scan but uh, ultrasound is the basically available investigation even a uh, post graduate can do the ultrasound for two days because the patient will go for ultrasound that's the thing speaking but, uh, the See, according to the literature if you compare ct with uh, ultrasound for visualization of gall bladder cbd and uh, liver ultrasound is much better than ct we all know that because yeah. it is superior to ultras i mean venkat for several reasons one it's a real time investigation two you can find out how vascular if something is done in the office you can do it because you are doing it you are sending it to another department we all know that ct scan will give better information when compared to ultrasound i am not talking about calculus polycystitis or a gallbladder stone where you may prefer an mrt ct here is there no will we come out of this ultrasound as the first investigation for most oncological or mass assessment that is my thing. no 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 this see this is specifically a mass possibly arising from liver 
your point about a ct being the primary investigation is well taken especially if it is you know arising from any other part of the abdomen bowel for example retroperitoneum then i agree but i think ultrasound will give you information from which you can concentrate and where to you know uh, <clears throat> look for as far as ct is concerned i as of now i think students are still expected to you know i do take your point in the sense ba basically I agree to all the discussions why i raised this issue is the point is very clear that so years ago there was no ultrasound also you are not even mentioning that then no ultrasound came then the ct mri everything came so the better ultrasound quality came but we as of today if i have to get a patient like this i know that i will not do an ultrasound okay so, so i think we'll, we'll is, proceed to the next investigation yeah, yeah. okay ultra, so the ct the ultra ultrasound will give us the information about the origin about the size about the whether it, you know whether it is solid cystic or mixed in in its uh, consistency and the vascularity of the lesion and its relation to the surrounding structures uh, whatever you know whether it will it will also give us the information about whether there is any intrahepatic biliary you know ductal dilatation it will give us information about the gall bladder and bile duct and as you said lymph node status in the porta hepatis as the presence of ascites so a lot of information can be gleaned by ultrasound okay. you need aspiration also can be done for the sampling if so now what, now let us go and uh, you know take what dr venkat said what will ct give us more in, in terms of information compared to the ultrasound sir ct will uh... tell us about the depth of the tumor sir and uh, invasion of any extra hepatic structures and also the arterial and if, if there is, if we use the triple phase ct we can know more about the vascularities so triple yeah. phase ct is always used in when you do liver and pancreas okay. so the triple phase will give us the information about the relation of the mass to the portal vein radicals to the you know vena cavall radicals the arterial phase will give us the information about whether it is a well vascularized lesion and is there peripheral ring en enhancement or is there you know diffuse enhancement and all these things will you know and the as you said the first of all better characterization of the lesion and also better characterization of it, the lesion and its relation to the surrounding structures we Definitely. think the most important finding what is venkat telling Yeah, it can detect the biliary communication. Yeah, so that changes your management also. Total vein involvement. Ah, that is the main. Yeah, not involvement. If cyst is communicating with the biliary canal, clay or biliary radical, then yeah. your yeah. treatment plan you have to close that opening also. Yeah, sure. And that is the important. Right, that I think that yeah. is important. Okay, so so be, you know students should know that you know you go in a methodical fashion. I think still Venkat's point. when you come to practice it different but as far as examination is concerned i think even dr mohan has put it in the chat box i think ultrasound scan is expected to be the first investigation and i think there are no major reasons not to do it because it does give you a lot of good information you can build on that by doing the ct scan and uh, so i think you should mention ultrasound scan as the first investigation of choice right and then you have done the cct and what other investigations would you now do depending on what you have seen on the ultrasound and ct do you have the results of this uh, sir we have the ct report sir yeah See, i told you no ultimately we come back to what is the ultrasound report you have the ultrasound report like show yeah. the ultrasound report first if you are told ultrasound you do ultrasound Ravishek, report uh, we not ah. is the student the no if you is... on my part yes sir yes yeah. hanmanth yeah let's see yes, dr hanmanth professor hanmanth hey, tell me See the thing is that we cannot confuse the students. The first thing they are supposed to say use the abdomen when they come to the examination. No, I, I have not confused them. I have told them this, right. no, no, this is how it has to be done. Yeah. No, no. If you have the ultrasound, please show the mention or at least read the ultrasound yeah. for the sake of. Uh, no, so that will be mentioned. No, after the ultrasound, CT has to be there. Correct. That's what. Yeah. So if you have the ultrasound report, at least read it out. It is not possible. No, the ultrasound report. I know the report. Yeah, please, yeah, the please report tell us. The report said uh, uh, single cyst of size 14 into 11 into 16 centimeter noted in the right lobe of the liver, sir, displacing the left lobe, uh -huh. uh, causing uh, uh, upward uh, uh, pushing the diaphragm on the right side upwards, sir. 
Yeah. With multiple internal echoes noted, so likely they gave hepatic hydrated cysts. That was the uh, and then the ash for CCT correlation. That was the uh, ultrasound finding, sir. Okay. So this is a CT. This is a CT, sir. What we have put up is a CT, sir. In CCT, they told the liver is enlarged in size and measures about 15 centimeters. Yeah. And there's a large thick walled multivesicular cystic lesion measuring of size 14 into 11 into 24 centimeters in the right lobe of the liver with superior margin herniating through the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity. Numerous daughter cysts with incomplete peripheral limb calcifications noted, likely hepa hepatic hydrated cyst or the CCT report, sir. Okay. You see some effusion on the right side? Uh, yes, sir. There was mild pleural effusion right also. Effusion, okay. Is now, okay. So I think the. Uh, the diagnosis is fairly clear. There is not much ambiguity. Now, given this situation, the patient is in a lot of, you know, is continuous pain and, uh, you know, is have, having fever. Now, how will you treat this patient? Ravi Shankar. Yes. Now, just I want to know, is there any confirmation of uh, the identity cyst serological? Sir, uh, you can, uh, what, what are the serological tests, uh, you know, uh, that you can do? Huh. We can do ELISA, sir, for immunoglobulins. Yeah. ELISA, we can be done, sir. How, what is its uh, specificity and sensitivity? Around uh, 90%, sir. Okay. So, will you do that here? Yes, uh, but then the CCT, the diagnose, radiologically only, we have already got the diagnosis as hepatic. It is still better, I think, if you, if you get, you know, because it is better to have multiple confirmation of your diagnosis. Uh, so, I think ELISA... Eliza, uh, you know, uh, test would be, you know, preferable. Okay. Previously, they used to do something called Cassonis test, which is no, no longer done. Okay. But, uh, you know, if there is a facility available for uh, Eliza, uh, you should do it because it's, it is fairly specific and sensitive, as you said, about 85 to 90 percent. So, you should do that. Now, the, given the patient, status of this patient, how would you, you know, proceed with the management? No, Ravi Shankar, advantage of uh, ELISA is you can know it is a dead cyst or a living cyst. Yeah. Sometimes dead cyst you can have a waiting or just absorption pulse. Correct. But in this patient, because he is symptomatic and it's very large, I don't think, and he's a young 55 year old male, I think conservative treatment is out of question. No, that's what so, I can say. Advantage yeah. of ELISA, I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, sure, sure. So, try to complement fixation. So, correct. It is it uh, calcified hydrated cyst. Usually, there will be calcifications, right? If it is dead. It, no, no. It calcification may take some more time. This symptomatology has been going on for a year. Maybe the symptom, the disease process is going on a bit more longer than that. But calcification is not always, you know, necessary um, to uh, diagnose a dead cyst. And calci if calcification is there, then it indicates that the cyst is dead. That's all. Maybe uh, effusion in that could be a field of uh, perforation of the cyst or rupture of the cyst. It, it could be the it could be an inflammatory reaction of the pleura for the time being because as of now the CT does not show any evidence of rupture. But that, that is potential imminent thing that can happen. And we have actually treated one patient who actually you know incidentally came from Rajarajeshwari Medical College to Sagar Hospital. The patient had already ruptured. And it, you know, they put an intercostal tube and a lot of daughter cysts came out. And he came to Sagar and we actually did a thoracoscopic decompression and removed entire, we didn't have to do a laparoscopy at all. Okay, let he the could, students answer. Yes, he sir. could remove the entire thing through the thoracoscopy. So as Venkat said, it is a potential that it could, uh, you know, you could have cysts in the pleura and also it can, you know, go on to the lungs as well. So, so the cinnamonic effusion, I think he has to continue with the correct. Uh, further uh, discussion. Sir. Yeah. So this is just a you know cinnamonic effusion as a, I think uh, that is the right the right word to use. Um, how will you manage this patient? Uh, sir, four goals sir mainly. First to inactivate the infected domain, uh, infected material sir, prevention yeah. of spillage sir, yeah. and uh, uh, evacuation of the viable materials and. Uh, Taking care of the retrieval cavity, sir. So we first started the patient on albendazole, so 10 mg per kg per day body weight. So hmm. approximately 4 mg BD for a period of 10 days, sir. Then hmm. we planned for a surgery, sir. Exploratory laparotomy and assist evacuation, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. Surgery, you planned direct laparotomy. Is there any other choices you wanted to give to the so patient? We could have planned for a pair, yeah. sir, puncture, aspiration, injection, and re-aspiration, sir. Okay. Since not, not, not this patient. See, pair is not indicated in a, such a large cyst. 
because it is probably unlikely that it will work in such a large cyst especially with imminent you know rupture into the pleural cavity i don't think you should even consider doing pair but what i think dr harish was asking was not you know could you not consider doing a laparoscopy can you consider laparoscopy uh, we could have sir but since okay. it was a large cyst and okay. no no i think the size of the cyst does not matter because okay. you do a thoracoscopic procedure rather than laparoscopic procedure no no you can here you probably because it is not actually ruptured into the pleura so i think what we should do is to do diagnostic laparoscopy you can have a, the you know the 10 mm sucker and you know you know gently open into the liver and you know aspirate all the daughter cysts and you know once you have done all that then you can instill hypertonic saline wait for a period of 20 minutes let him answer sir let him yeah. uh, postgraduate answer okay so we will proceed with the diagnostic laparoscopy or in a laparotomy uh, no. what, what will you do what procedure will you do we will open the cyst cavity sir aspirate huh. all the contents sir yeah we, uh, what are the cyst. precautions you will take you just you know, start sir, with the we'll precautions place the high colored mops around the cyst cavity sir we'll laparoscopy or laparotomy so laparoscopy right so either of the, one, one explain about no, he, because they were they are talking about laparotomy let us talk let them talk about laparotomy so we place high colored mops dipped in cholecystal agent sir we use yeah. trimide 5% as cholecystal agent sir okay we created a cyst cavity sir then yeah. we filled the cyst cavity with trimide solution for a period of 15 to 20 minutes sir huh. then we reaspirated sir huh. then we masticulized the cyst cavity sir now one thing is did you give any um uh, this one uh, hydrocortisone or anything it the anesthetist is give anything to prevent anaphylaxis we, uh, there was no spillage of the cyst no no but, but still it, there could potentially it was given sir ah uh, that is important you have to mention that the anesthetist have to be warned yeah. about it they should be ready they should also give prophylactic uh, hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone or whatever to prevent anaphylaxis and also adrenaline and other things should be ready in case anaphylaxis happens and your you know your uh, precautions about cholecystal agent and you know the the you know high color the colored towels all those things are well taken now what other dr durgana had mentioned it when he discussed the, the diagnosis especially when he talked about the ct after you have actually you know evacuated the contents what is that one important thing that you ah, do sir we to... look for biliary communication sir ah you... very good it so with the bile stain then it indicates biliary communication so what how will you confirmation of the identity how it is the aspiration looks that is important first correct proceeding so if your contents are you know bile stain then it indicates to you that there is possibly a bil- or not possibly there is a bil- biliary communication so you have to be you know after you have evacuated and as you said put this you know cholecystal agent it could be cetrimide it could be hypertonic saline previously they used to use absolute alcohol which is no longer used so you can use either of these things and after that what how do you look for um, biliary communication sir we can gently squeeze the gall bladder sir to see any bile leak into the no no i, I how you, you expect the gall bladder pressure to go through the bile duct and this one right i think that is superfluous the best that is why i think what harish mentioned about laparoscopy that you know this is where laparoscopy comes into its own so once you have actually done a laparoscopic uh, you know evacuation and everything you put the scope inside the cavity and because the laparoscopy gives you a magnified illuminated view you know even smaller bile duct leaks will be visible on the uh, pan and the monitor so that is why even if you have done an open surgery in this patient your hospital will have a you know a laparoscopic uh, camera so put the camera inside and you can uh, you know because you it gives you a magnification anywhere between 3 and 1/2 time to 5 times and it is also you know well lit because of the the light source so you can bri- see the you know bile leak if it is there so if it is let us say for argument sake if it is there what will you do sir we can uh, primarily close the defect if it is a small defect and place a t tube drain not t tube drain you can't put, where will you put the t tube no sir abdomen abdominal drain has to be placed sir correct you have to place a drain into the uh, cavity yeah. into the cavity no actually ravi shankar yeah manish you have to tell how to manage the remaining residual cavity 
Marshall. Once yeah. you are complete procedure. No, no. We, yeah, I, I will come to that. But I was asking him about the bile leak so far. So, you know, what you have to suture the bile leak. Where, see, what would happen is, as you know, you, in the bile end of you have the diagram. The, as the cyst enlarges, it stretches the biliary canaliculi and at some point, there is pressure necrosis of the bile radical and that will then start leaking into the cyst. So basically, it will be a, a, a virtually you know, in a, a elongated slit in the biliary canaliculi. So or bile duct, it may be segmental duct or whatever. So you will have to suture the biliary communication. All of these biliary communications have to be sutured using fine 3040 PDS sutures. Okay. So you have to ensure you look for each and every biliary communication and suture them. So that is critical. Right. Once you have dealt with the biliary communication, now we'll come to what Dr. Durgan asked, Professor Durgan asked, uh, how will you deal with the size of the residual cavity? Yes, so there are four four, we are left sir. with the four minutes. I think we'll ask some questions and we'll uh, wind up the program. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, I think uh, proceed with the answer. So, yeah. The clearance of the... There question. are uh, multiple ways of closing the cavity, sir. Uh, yeah, one yeah. is uh, marsupialization, sir. Huh. Second one is uh, capitonage. Uh -huh. Then we can do intraflexion and then omentoplasty also is there, sir. Correct. So I think the main, see, these days mainly, uh, especially I think now we have to, as students, I have to, you know, advise you that the first treatment of choice, as Dr. Harish has mentioned, has to be a diagnostic laparoscopy, laparoscopic assisted procedure, laparoscopic, uh, you know, uh, evacuation of the cyst and management of the biliary, you know, uh, is going to leak. And uh, you know, you know, complete evacuation and uh, you know, a scolicidal agent. And then you can, if there is biliary leak, after you close the leak, you put a drain and you put the momentum into that. Most of the time, that would be sufficient. I think if the you know marsupialization is done, if the cyst cavity is extremely large, and you have to do that to reduce the size of the cavity, occasionally. If the cyst, you know, if the, uh, the available liver tissue is this one, you can even consider segmental or uh, non-anatomic resection of the liver. But those are rare instances. Okay. So now you have done all these things. How far will you, uh, how is the future course of management of this patient? So post-operatively, we'll continue the patient for a month on albendazole tablets, sir. Not one month. One, one to three months. Three months. Three months. Three months. Three months. You have to continue the treatment for a period of three months. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, also, as I think Dr. Um, you know, Mo Mohan is suggesting on the chat box, biliary fistula can happen post-operatively also. So you have to be careful. Let us say you have biliary fistula in the post-operative phase. What, what will you do? So for third day or fourth day, you start seeing bile in the drain that you have put in. Even though you have on the table, you have looked very carefully and you have sutured, closed all the bile leaks, still it can happen. So what will you do in that situation? Anybody? How will you monitor the patient? You wanted to do conservative? You wanted to do any other investigations? What Sir, quantity of bile leak is there? You should look at yeah. What is the amount of bile leak? You will decide. So a... You have to monitor the amount, as Dr. Harish said. If it is minimal, if it is less than 200 ml, you watch the patient. Most of the time, this will probably close and be, as the fibrosis sets in, it may close on its own. So you don't have to do anything. If the bile leak persists beyond a certain time or if it keeps increasing, then you may have to consider doing an ERCP. And if once you do an ERCP, you will see where the bile is leaking. You can go and stent that particular duct and that will stop the bile leak. Okay. Sometimes even we are doing ERTP, sphincterotomy yeah. also helps. Correct. Sphincterotomy yeah. and, you know, the stenting of particular bile duct from where the leak is happening. So that is the, I think, uh, I think what Dr. Professor Durgana said is right. If you relieve, if you do a sphincterotomy, the intra biliary pressures will come down and help the bile to drain in the, through the normal orifice also. Now in this symptomatic patient, yeah. do we have to give 10 days of albendazole or go for surgery up front? No, I think, uh, um, you know, though because he is symptomatic for a month, for a year, so 10, you know, giving 10 days is probably the, you know, most logical uh, thing, I think. You know, there is no, unless you are suspecting imminent rupture, 
you can you know you you know you can wait for 10 days give them albendazole and then treat them if in normal circumstances it is usually two weeks worth of albendazole and then surgery but here you know maybe 10 days is good enough and then you continue the treatment for three what is the recurrence rates in such patient Sir, if there is no spillage, there should not be any recurrence, sir. No, no, no. Even if there is no spillage, there is recurrence. Always you have to give, first oh. of all. Recurrence is okay. there, but I know you are, your point is that if there is no spillage, the recurrence rates are less. Yes, sir. But you can't say no recurrence rates at all. Less, less recurrence rates. Yeah. What is the percentage? So, if, the, if there is no spillage and things, you, the recurrence rates are anything about 5% or less. If there is spillage, then it can go up to about 15 to 20 percent. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So, so I that it is to not to be taken lightly. It can even today it can be quite uh, dangerous, sometimes fatal. So you have to manage them properly. It, it is a multidisciplinary approach. The anesthetists, the physician, the gastroenterologists, all have to be involved. Okay. I think uh, in summary. You both of you have presented the case very well, but you have to remember in the exams, you do will not have the facility of the PowerPoint presentation. So you should be able to present similarly without the help of a PowerPoint presentation. So practice that. I think it's a good presentation and you have justified your answers well. So you, I would I would pass both of you. Dr. Rajshekar, what do you say? What do you say, sir? Yes, sir. So thank you so much. Discussion, sir. It was a, a refreshing uh, discussion for me because I am out of touch with these things. It's a refreshing. I learned certain things. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi Shankar, sir, for a good moderation of this case capsule. So I thank both the postgraduates and I congratulate for the good presentation. So now we will move on to the poster presentation. No, one Before minute, Ravish, uh, one minute, just one minute. Ravi Shankar. Yes, sir. Is a complication of iodine disease the imminent the dis, uh, imminent rupture? Yeah. If rupture into pleural cavity, how do you manage? So rupture into pleural cavity, you have to uh, no, no, do, a, do a combined thoracoscopic stroke laparoscopic approach. Right, so you have to do and and, and you have to do a video assisted uh, trans, uh, thoracoscopic procedure. Uh, you um, obviously evacuate all the it's one daughter cysts and this one. And most of the time, uh, you have to put an intercostal drainage and you know then manage the intercostal drainage as you would manage any other intercostal drain. And then you, you may have to do a laparoscopy and follow the same procedure, drain into the uh, cyst cavity, drain into the subphrenic space, and then, you know, depending on the drain, you manage them. Yeah. No, so first thing, no, if the lap thoracoscopy yeah. is not available, just yeah. simple ICD is sufficient. Yeah, simple ICD will more, be sufficient. And then you one do more a into the cavity. Yeah, and then you yeah. do a laparotomy and do all the evacuation from, in, from below. If uh, uh, like thoracoscopy is not available, completely. if thoracoscopy is not available, you may have you can actually access the whole thing through the laparotomy. You can even consider doing a thoraco abdominal approach also. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Thank so, you. So, uh, before starting the program uh, of a poster presentation uh, on behalf of Surgical Society Bangalore, uh, I welcome Dr. Venkatesh, sir, the HOD of. Uh, Department of Surgery, Raja Rajeshwari Medical College, our beloved president of Surgical Society Bangalore, Dr. Venkta Chala, and our uh, eminent uh, professors of Raja Rajeshwari Medical College, Dr. Durgana, sir, Dr. Arman Thayya, sir, Dr. Satyarayan, sir, uh, Revana Siddhaya, sir, uh, Dr. Kadri, sir. So, recording, okay. Yeah.